So let's just present this first screen. And this is supporting all students with inclusive technology. I will give you this class code again uh, in just a couple of minutes so we can all get connected. Starting off with our land acknowledgement as we always do for our workshops. The Durham District School Board acknowledges that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships both historic and modern, with the territories upon which our school board and schools are located. Today, this area is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge that the Durham region forms a part of the traditional and treaty territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, the Mississauga peoples, and the treaty territory of the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation. It is on these ancestral and treaty lands that we teach, learn, and live. So here's our agenda for this afternoon. We're gonna start off with a welcome. Hello, welcome, happy Friday afternoon. So glad to have you. It's a big crowd this afternoon. I think we got about 75 or so that have registered and it's so great. Um, I'm Steve, I'm an inclusive technology trainer supporting students um, in the DDSB at home virtual schools. For the three years before this one, I supported all the schools in Whitby and Ajax. So I came into your schools and I work with your students who have SIA technology, Chromebooks, lap laptops, iPads, etc. It is an absolutely fantastic position and I'm really stoked about all this inclusive technology that I have been immersed in for like three and a half years. Uh, the voice that you already heard belongs to none other than Kelly McCarthy. Kelly is my guest this afternoon. She is my friend and she is also a CERT at the DDSB at Home uh, Virtual Schools as well. I love to have CERTs join me when I'm doing these workshops for a number of reasons. They can uh, provide a perspective, an in-school working with students perspective um, that really benefits. Plus, they have a regular, certs that is, have a regular working relationship with educational assistants. So I really enjoy bringing certs in from the perspective that they, that they give. They know about your job and, and Kelly certainly fits all of those bills. I've asked her here this afternoon uh, to lend her perspective, to keep an eye on the chat she is super duper experienced with all this technology stuff, so she can help if you've got any questions or challenges or anything that's not working as we're going along. So we're going to keep her super busy by um, putting lots of stuff on the chat. Um, so our, our focus this afternoon, I mean, you're looking at it. It's, uh, there's seven things on this agenda. When I attend a workshop, uh, I like to come away with at least one thing, just one thing that I can take back and add to my practice. This afternoon, I've, I've created, uh, we're going to cover a whole bunch of different topics, and I'm going to give you 26 different, and wait for it, terrific technology tips, tricks, tools, and troubleshooting. Yes, I like alliteration. And hopefully, out of that 26, those 26 things, you'll be able to take back one or two to add to your practice. So it is an ambitious uh, lineup that we've got, but I really, really enjoy uh, working with all this technology stuff. So in just a second, we're gonna take a look at the Google Classroom that I've set up for you and I'm gonna get you to join. Um, first of all, the rest of the agenda, what's in your technology toolbox? So we're gonna take a look at, at that and how it relates to our kids. This whole afternoon is a student-centric presentation. So as you are um, working along with me, I want you to think about those students that you support and how their unique needs um, could, uh, could be assisted with the use of some of this technology that we're, that we're looking at. So everything that we do is with students in mind and the technology is great. So we're going to look at the Chromebook Advantage, specifically the Chromebook Accessibility Tools. Um, number four is adding student voice using Moat. Moat is fantastic. So I'm, I'm, we're going to spend some time working with that. Yes, we're going to do some work with the Purple Puzzle piece. There is a ton of you here. I, don't, I, I recognize some names of some of you who have taken workshops with me before, but there's a whole lot of names I don't recognize. 
So we're gonna go through the purple puzzle piece and we're gonna learn how it benefits all our students. I've got a few tips and tricks for you in Google Classroom, some things that I've seen that we can really use to benefit our kids. And finally, we're gonna get a little bit organized with a couple of different things. Okay, so again, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And let's, oh, I should tell you, this is a live demo. So this Google Slides presentation, I think there's five slides in it in total. Everything else is live. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that didn't work for me this morning, but that's, that's reality. That's what our kids deal with every day. So I like to do my workshops live. It makes it more authentic and sometimes a whole heck of a lot more challenging. Let's go into Google Classroom. Sorry, can I just ask a quick question? Of course. Um, I just got added in because I didn't receive a link, so I'm afraid I missed a portion about what we do for attendance or anything. I haven't even talked about attendance, to be perfectly Perfect. honest. Perfect. Sorry about that. No problem. I'm glad you're here. So here, here's what I want you to do first. Um, will you please, if you haven't done so already, will you please open up Google Classroom? And I'm gonna give you this code. And I want you to click the plus button in the top right corner of the Google Classroom app and join our classroom using this code. And I will also put that on the chat so you can have it later on as well. Actually, Kelly, do you mind putting the Google Class code on the chat for people just in case they don't get it right away? Don't worry, I'll be your Vanna, Steve. Oh my gosh, isn't that exciting? Man, oh man. Okay, our, our class roster has already jumped to 60, so I know a whole lot of you have already joined. We'll give you one more minute. We have 73 in, in attendance, including myself. Fantastic. So that's how many you're uh, expecting. I'm, I'm told there's no matches for my search. <laughs> so am I looking in the wrong spot? <laughs> Yikes. I've gone to the Google Classroom, so I've loaded them up. I put it in the top part and it just says it's not there. Okay. okay. So, so Catherine, you are going to the Google Classroom app, right? No, it's Anna, it but it's okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I was looking at the chat. So oh. I thought, so Google Classroom, and once you're in Google Classroom, you can click the plus button okay. and click join class and then enter your class code that Kelly put in the Google Meet chat. Okay. That will bring you right in. All right. So let's just take, the, the reason why I put together this Google Classroom is because I wanted to offer you as many resources as possible. So I mentioned the 26 terrific technology tips, tricks, tools, and troubleshooting. Well, I actually put that doc right here in the Google Classroom. And this is going to be the structure for what we're going to be doing this afternoon. So it's there. You don't have to take notes. You don't have to remember. Each of the sections of this workshop, I've got some resources. So I'm really, really big on the visual, the hands-on, the, um, the videos. So I've given you different videos for all sorts of different things. So I will reference this throughout the, the workshop. Okay, so in each section, scrolling down, here's some resources for Moat. There's resources for the Purple Puzzle piece, Google Classroom. And then I've also added in a couple of fun activities that we're going to do because I don't just want to talk to you or talk at you for two and a half hours. I actually want you to be using these tools a little bit. So I've created a couple of activities as well. 
All right, so that, that's why I've created the Google Classroom. You have access to these things and um, you can reference them later if you so choose. All right, so let's move on to what's in your technology toolbox. So I'm gonna go back to the slide, the Google slide presentation. And I love showing this slide, the slide that's coming up. Because when I first started this, uh, this job in 2017, I was doing workshops and this was what our technology toolbox looked at the time. So for those of you who have been around and working with this, these tools for a while, you probably remember and have the scars to show it about working with our students using Kurzweil and WordCube and smart ideas and smart notebook and clicker six, all of these tools were available and we were using them as, as recently as 2017, 2018. Um, and then above the green line, so these are our old legacy systems and above the green line was what we were doing a couple of years ago. We still had the, the, the dual platform with Microsoft. So I was doing a lot of training for students on OneNote and using Office and figuring out how the purple puzzle piece works with Microsoft and OneNote. It does, but it was pretty tricky. And then of course we had the Google side as well. So our technology toolbox, and feel free to put on the chat any observations you have about working with Kurzweil, try not to swear. Um, our, our technology toolbox has changed quite a bit over the last couple of years. It's really, really involved. So let's take a look at it now, right? Oh my gosh, has it ever changed? So I designed this specifically with the Chrome OS and Google Read and Write as the foundation at the bottom, okay? Because that really is the foundation for all of the tools. Remember, inclusive technology is something that benefits everyone but is essential for the students that you and I support. And Google Read and Write and Google Chrome and the Chrome accessibility tools, they are essential for so many of our kids. And then you layer over top of that a number of other tools. Well, we're all using Google Classroom right now. And I'm gonna show you a few tricks and, and tips how you can make it more inclusive for our students. So now our students need to navigate Meet every day. We're gonna be talking about Moat. <laughs> Meet? Moat. We're gonna be talking about Moat, which is, which is really awesome. We've got Boardmaker 7 now, which is a great step up from the old Boardmaker. Um, you know, there's a lot of brainstorming that happens in Jamboard. We've got the whole G Suite for Education, Docs, um, uh, Sheets, Google Drive, slides and forms. Plus we've got the organizational tools over here, Google Keep, Calendar and Tasks. My goodness, if this doesn't make your head swim, I don't know what does. And then if you think about it, this is what our kids have to navigate, right? So you've got a, a 10 year old student with autism trying to navigate some of these, some of these things. Um, that's why, you know, this being part of our toolbox it's so important, right? So the message that I'm gonna leave with you when looking at all of this stuff is that you wanna encourage your students to use the tools that work best for them. You got a student that's got a, a, a speech impediment and the speech to text tools don't work so, so well, that's fine. We have other tools that will be even better for them. Right? So we can, we can really meet our students where they're at with all these tools. And the way that I operate when I'm training my students, I always tell them, hey, I'm going to give you tools for your toolbox. It's up to you to determine when it's appropriate to use it. So that's, that's the choice that we're giving our students with all of these things. All right. And by all means, Fire your questions down on the on the chat and, and Kelly can definitely handle them for you. Let's take a look at the Chromebook advantage. And it really is an advantage for our students. They provide an incredible advantage. So I'm using a Chromebook right now. I'm guessing many of you are as well. 
If you're using a Chromebook right now, you have access to the Chrome OS accessibility tools. Notice how at the bottom right corner, I clicked right where the time is, and this, this menu pops up. You might already see this accessibility person right here. This is where all your tools are. And if I click this, you can see that there's a list of a dozen and a half different things. And I'm just gonna show you a few. So I have got on large mouse cursor right now and highlight mouse cursor. So I adore large mouse cursor and it's great for our students, especially students who need that extra little bit of focus or have the visual impairment, right? So great big mouse cursor. Every time I move it, the red circle appears around it so I can always see where it is, okay? These are two that I absolutely will use all the time. Here's another two that are fantastic. Can I, can I also say, um, Steve, those are fantastic and I use those all the time with students, like you said, with low vision. Um, also, um, any kids with ADHD, with focus issues, 100%, those are absolutely fantastic. Um, even kids with autism trying to get um, to point out specific things when you're doing step by step, um, that is a fantastic feature. So I 100% agree and I, I'm, it, it, it might seem very, very simple, but those simple little things really add to the benefit. So definitely I agree with that. 100% Kelly, thank you. Um, the, the other two that I want to point out right now are these two that are right down here on my, my uh, toolbar. And if you don't see that accessibility person, that's fine. We're gonna, we're, we'll, I'll show you how to turn it on in a sec. Um, Google Dictation, it's the speak tool. It's a speech to text tool that works anywhere on your Chromebook. So right now I've got my cursor flashing. That's where I'm going to type. I can click dictation and I can speak, you'll hear it beep and then I'm gonna talk and it's gonna type, cute puppy pictures. So for those of you who needed to see a cute puppy picture this afternoon, you are in luck. We are on a similar mind and there they are. But isn't it great how it typed for me, right? Um, um, Stephen, there's a couple of questions in the tab right now that says I don't have accessibil accessibility on mine. Um, and does the tab only work when you're in a DDSB um, site? And do they work on iPads and desktops? Okay, so uh, one question at a time. The access if you don't have the accessibility person right now, I'll, I'll, I'll do this now. Okay. Click the gear. Okay, so this is for the pink it, one. It's going to take you to the settings menu Scrolling down on the left-hand side, you'll find advanced. Scrolling down, you're going to look for accessibility. The other way is just to open up settings and do a search on accessibility. When I click that, there's a little radio button right here that I wanna make sure is blue. Okay. If that's blue, it shows up on the, on the menu. Okay, so that's, that's so how you can help on. out Caitlin and, then, and Jean. Yes, thank okay. you so much. Okay, so now. two of my friends. And then we also have Anna Marie. Does that tab only work when you are in a DDSB setting? Okay, it does not. It works when you are on a, it, using your Chrome, um, if you're using a Chromebook. Right? So a DDSB Chromebook, a personal Chromebook, you need to be using the Chrome OS operating system though. This does not work, right? So these are, these are Chrome accessibility tools. So it doesn't work if we're running Windows, right? So on a desktop, on a Windows laptop, on a MacBook, anything like that. There may be other speech to text tools on those devices, but these are only on our Google devices. Okay, so a Chromebook is a Google device. That's it. Okay, okay. Does, does, does that help? Yep, and last question, do they work on iPads and desktops? Okay, a, again, I, an, a desktop is a Windows device, so they will have other tools to do speech to text, but not these, okay. right? Okay. So only for a Chromebook. So 
Anywhere on your Chromebook, you can click the dictation tool, and as long as you can type, it will type for you. Now, one of the, one of the things that I show my students, every student I work with, is how awesome it works on the chat in Google Meet. I can use Google Dictation, and then I don't have to type when I'm putting a message on my Google Meet chat window. Such an awesome tool. Now, sometimes you have to watch out because it will, like everything else, make mistakes. Now, a lot of times, and the reason why I show kids this is a lot of times teachers are asking them to put things on the chat when they're doing Google, uh, Google Meets. And if they have issues with spelling or, or having, having trouble with the keyboard or fine motor issues, et cetera, that can be a real challenge. So Google Dictation is a really, really good option. So Dictation, the speak button. Now I want to show you this one right here, select to speak, which is right beside it. If this is the speak button, this is the listen button. And this will read things to you on your Chromebook. So when I click this, I can notice how it turns gray. I clicked it, it's on, it turns gray. And then I want to indicate what I want it to read. So I'm going to drag and select you. this text. 12, 51 p.m. I can use Google Dictation. Oh my and gosh, I don't it's have reading to, type to me. When I'm putting a message on my Google Meet chat window. Such an awesome tool. So here, the, it's these tools that make such an advantage for our kids when you're using a Chromebook, okay? Because now I can use this tool to type. I can use this tool to read all sorts of different things. Watch this. I'm going to click, and I'm going to click all the way up here at the top. There's some text up here. I'm going to click it. Cute puppy pictures, Google search. Whoa. I'm going to click this. And then I'm going to click one of these buttons down at the bottom. Sora by Overdrive. It even tells me what things are. Okay, I can be in, let's see, let's go to Google Drive. You're kind of getting the idea. It reads things that the purple puzzle piece doesn't. So it's complementary. These tools down at the bottom are complementary to the purple puzzle piece that I'm going to show you in just a little while. Click. Uh, how about this? Crider, secondary. It even pronounces my name correctly. I love this tool. Steven, I have another two questions in the chat box I will ask you. And they're basically um, asking about the buttons. Are these options or are these buttons in accessibility? Supporting all students with inclusive technology, Google Slides. Okay, stop it. Um, yeah, every uh, here, here they are right here. So if I, once you've turned on the accessibility person, okay, you can click select to speak, and okay. then you can click dictation. And then it'll okay. ask you to use your microphone. You click the blue allow button, and it will turn on, and it will show up on your, on your taskbar down at the bottom. Okay, so everybody, okay, so I have several questions. So that should answer all the questions to the people that are in the chat that are asking. Um, so that's perfect. Everybody's questions are answered. I'm still trying to get one person into the Google Classroom who hopefully is going to call me. Um, so Catherine, I sent you an email. If you read it, it's got my telephone number. Call me, okay? All right. So actually, I, I, I have I'm in now, I think it says supporting all students with inclusive technology. You are right there. All OK. There. So. All right. Thank you very much. OK, so, so here's here's what I want, want to do. If I, and, and this is just a fun little activity. I've got a Friday fun activity. I've got a little jam board here that we're going to actually do a little jamming. So 
we're going to create, I'm going to open up Jamboard and I created this for all of you. And I want you to create a sticky note on the workshop frame for the afternoon and just share a little pers personal connection about the Google accessibility tools. And tell us about a student you're supporting who would really benefit from this and maybe why, right? And, and don't forget, if you're using a Chromebook, make sure you actually try Google Dictation when you're creating your sticky note. So for those of you who haven't seen Jamboard, I'm just opening it up right now. These are the ones that we did this morning. So we're gonna click and go to the afternoon workshop frame. So this is frame number two. And if you wanted to create a sticky note over here on the left-hand side, you can create it in the color of your choice. You can click, I like pink, you can click, whoops, you can click, and then as soon as your cursor is flashing, you can click Google Dictation and tell me what you think of the Google accessibility tools. We're gonna to take a couple of minutes and do that now. Please. Uh, I also have somebody asking about how do you get to Jamboard? You've, they've never used it before. It's right in Google Classroom. Okay, so, so it's- created right the assignment right here, okay. right in Google Classroom under the Chromebook Advantage. Okay. And so then- just right. click, on, click on the Jamboard, and then I see there's a whole bunch of people that are in it right now. I see about 15 people. Okay, so Brittany, do you see that? No, but I'm looking. Okay, Andrew, so it's in the assignment section. It's, yeah, it's under assignment, yes. It'll be under the, the classwork section. So instead of in the, so looking in the, see, I can't, I'm not in the classroom because what I'm doing is I'm looking at the chat and trying to answer questions and answering emails. Yeah, people Kelly, Kelly, I'm just, I'm just going to show it. Okay. So we're, if, if you open up Google Classroom and then under the Chromebook Advantage, there's Friday Fun. Clicking on Friday Fun will open it up and you'll see the link to Jamboard if you click. The writing with Google dictation, it'll open up the Jamboard and you can see that there are a whole bunch of sticky, sticky notes. Note. That are in. I got an error saying that there's too many people using it, so it won't let me on. Isn't that interesting? Okay. See, this is a little bit of learning that we're doing this morning. I also got the same thing. There's too many people on and can't go in. Same here. Oh. Then that so, makes sense because hey, as soon as you're done entering your sticky note, please exit out of the Jamboard and then uh, see if other people can get back in. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, um, Steve, because most classrooms don't hold more than 30 people and we have 79. Yeah. So that would make sense. I've, I've never seen any documentation say, that says there's a limit, but I guess there is. I just don't know what it is. So yeah, as soon as you've added your sticky note, tell me again, we're talking about our students here. So think about the student that you're working with and how some of these tools might, be, might benefit them. So somebody wrote, love the accessibility tools. I have a few students who use them for writing assignments and the difference it makes for them is huge. Feel like I never stopped learning little things about them. Love it. Like, like that. So, okay. I'm um, a new BSB supply yay hire, and I'm so excited to be learning all about these tools to help support students I work with and parents who are figuring out e-learning. Thank you for sharing these tools to add to my toolbox. Your toolbox is growing. Amazing. All right, we're gonna we're gonna do this for another couple of minutes. This will still be here, so you can add your comments later and have a chance to play around with it. And I just like hit that, and it. I can't get into the classroom and be in the meeting at the same time.
Jean, you are so kind. All right. So you, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna move on. And then the next, but we're, we're still gonna talk about the accessibility tools because one of the things that I wanna leave uh, you with is that you can really customize the student Chromebook for your individual unique student. So I've given you a couple of, um, a couple of videos. I, I've got one in particular is called Exploring the Vision Support Tools. Right? There are so many different things, and we alluded to this earlier, that you can turn on to help your students so that the Chromebook works for them. Such an incredible advantage. I find when I'm working with a student on a Chromebook compared to working with a student on one of the, one of the yoga laptops, it is night and day. Okay. Um, the other benefit and I'm just going to scroll down and take a look at the troubleshooting section. Remember, I've got all sorts of different topics here, and one of them is troubleshooting. The Chromebook is also way easier to fix if you have a problem with it. So if you are meeting with a student or a family and, and you hear that the touchscreen isn't working or the trackpad isn't, isn't working or it keeps shutting down when it's not supposed to, like things like that, the vast majority of problems can be fixed through a simple procedure called a power wash. Now a power wash is a dumb name for re-imaging the Chromebook. So what I've done is I've included a procedure, a very simple procedure. It takes five minutes, honestly, five minutes to power wash a Chromebook. And in my experience, it fixes 95% of the problems. If you go through a power wash and the problem persists, then you know that there is a significant hardware problem with the Chromebook and a help ticket has to be submitted so that it's it, it can get replaced. But this is one of the first things that I do when I'm troubleshooting with my families. I've even run through this with a grade five student, a 10 year old boy, the two of us did it together and we power washed his Chromebook and it was successful and it worked. Okay, so this is not rocket science. It takes you about four hours to re-image a laptop. It takes five minutes to do a Chromebook. Here's another thing to look for. If you are um, working with a family who has a personal Chromebook, okay, not a DDSB one, but a personal Chromebook, and they tell you that for some reason the tools aren't working properly, they don't have access to Google Read and Write, they can't get into their Google, just the things are weird then here, here's what you know. You know that when they created, when they first set up the Chromebook, their personal Chromebook, they used a personal email address. What you need to ask them to do is to power wash their Chromebook and set it up using the student's DDSB account. So this will give them a Chromebook, a personal Chromebook that works identically to the, um, the, the DDSB ones that, that we have. No more problems, okay? So I, I wanted to make sure that we understood, and again, I've got, let's, let's see, let's go back to Google Classroom. And remember, I've got a couple of things for you under troubleshooting. I've got fixing problems on a DDSB Chromebook. That's a video that I created for students and families and the Chromebook Power Wash instructions that are right here uh, for you as well, okay? Troubleshooting is a huge part of working with technology. Moving on. Let's take a look at our agenda to see where we're at. The Chromebook Advantage, yes, we love our Chromebooks. Let's take a look, adding student voice using Moat. Oh my goodness, this is one of the most awesome things. Let's take a look at Moat. Let's take a look at Moat on Google Classroom. Okay, the purple circle. This little guy in Google Classroom. 
it is an incredible tool that allows our kids and notice a whole bunch of the the years in this morning we're adding uh, moats to the classroom what it specifically does when i click the purple circle it records my voice and i can leave that voice recording right on google classroom so i explain it to students like this when you are in your real classroom, remember them? When you're in your real classroom and you have a problem, you can put up your hand. The teacher will come up to you and say, hey, what's your problem? And you use your voice to ask your question. This is what you do when you're working in Google Classroom. So I'm gonna click this and I'm gonna say hi. Hi, I'm Steve. I'm an inclusive technology trainer with the DDSB Inclusive Student Services. I am taking this workshop this morning because I love inclusive technology and how it's a real benefit to our students. When I click the done button, notice how the purple circle changes to a pencil. If I click the, set, the pencil, listen. Hi, I'm Steve. Inclusive Technology Trainer with the DESB Inclusive Student Service. Pause. So I just made a 17 second recording of my voice. Man, oh man, you can say a lot in 17 seconds. Now, if I'm happy with that, I can click send and I can put that right on my Google, uh, Google Classroom for my teacher or for my class to hear. If I wanna try it again, I'm gonna delete that. And the pencil turns into a circle and I can do it again. You know what? I like this. Steven? Here's what we're going to do. Hang on, Kelly, just a sec. Okay, no problem. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to send you a link and we're all going to install mode. That's exactly what I was going to ask. That purple circle and put it on our Google Classroom. After you're done installing it, we're going to refresh Google Classroom, and I want everybody to come down here, down to the very bottom of the stream, click Moat, and say hello, who you are, what school you're at, and why you decided to take this workshop this morning. Okay, so first things first, let's install, let's install Moat. So I'm going to put a link on the chat and it's just going to make things just a wee little bit quicker but you can see what i'm doing here right i'm just doing a search on moat and then i'm going to click copy and i'm going to go to the chat and i'm going to paste you just read my mind, Stephen. That's why I love working with you. <laughs> okay. Will you please, everyone, click that link, go to the Chrome Web Store, install Moat. There's a number, of, like a couple of steps. It's really straightforward. Try giving that an install and then go back to Google Classroom. Remember, right down at the bottom and say hi, not just hi. If you run into problems, just put it on the chat and we will address it. Yes, we will. This is why you're the master, Stephen, at this. Oh my goodness. You just read people's minds. Kelly, I'm expecting you to put your uh, your introduction on. Oh, come your, on, Stephen. Mute your microphone, please.
Once you've got it installed, go back to Google Classroom, click Refresh, and then scroll all the way down to the bottom of the stream so you can add a brand new introduction right down here at the bottom. And remember, you're using the purple circle. Okay, Greer left me a voice note. Let's see. There's some of the people from this morning. Scrolling down. Oh, Tracy, thank you. Karen, thank you. Who's going to be next? Jean, yes. Go through the steps to install Moat. Do that first. And then go back to Google Classroom, click the refresh button, and you should see the purple circle right on the class comment or class comments. Karen, Laura, Fiona, Renee, Jody, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer one of my Lester B. Pearson friends, Jessica. If you're in Google Chrome, there should still be that refresh button in the top left corner. Caitlin, make sure that you refresh your Google Classroom window and it will pop up. Sorry, that was Karen that asked that question about the ThinkPad. In Google Chrome, you're looking for the little refresh button at the top. And yes, it probably will pick up my voice. I'm trying to talk quietly so that you don't get the melodious sound of my voice in your recording. Kevin. Another Lester B. Pearson friend. Sorry, guys. Can I just ask? I I added the extension of Moat and signed in, but on my Google Classroom page, I'm still not seeing the icon to actually record my voice. And did you click the refresh button? Because that's the important step. Once you've got it installed and signed in, and everything's all ready to rock and roll, you got to refresh the page. I did. So it is there. If I click on my extensions little piece. In the top right. Yeah, you don't even need to do that. It's actually going to show up on Google yeah. on Google Classroom. Okay, I'll try to refresh again. Yeah, let's do that. Hi, Steve. Sorry, Anna here. I did it, and it said your moat book. There are no moats in in your moat book. If you want to add moats here next, you record a moat. Click the preview button and click Save As. So where's the preview button? <laughs> okay, we're doing this entirely from Google Classroom, Anna. So. Yeah. Instead of clicking the mode um, extension at the top. So I know. I, I've got it. Like, I've re refreshed the stream, and it's in the bottom yeah. of the stream. Like, it's and down you, there. I click on it. It. Yeah, I click on it, but that's what I get. Every time I click on that, it tells me that your mo there, there are no moats in your moat book. Which is kind of a weird way of saying it. You, you know what I would recommend? It, it's it's just it's a really simple troubleshooting thing. I would just honestly, I would remove it from Chrome, and then reinstall, reinstall it. Try it all over again, and I bet it's going to work the the next time. Okay, because I had to take a little survey too. They wanted to know what school I was at, what I teach. Let's, <laughs> let's not do that. Yeah, you don't you don't even need to enter all that information. I, oh, I, too late! I, I already did. <laughs> I don't, oh well. Okay. So Diane, you haven't joined our classroom. Did you not get the, we had a classroom code. I can give that code to you again. 
to get you in there. Stephen, I'm also wondering if people aren't going to stream instead of classwork. They need to go into stream to do it. Uh, for Yeah, for sure. For sure, for sure. I'm seeing a whole lot of people very excited. Hey, Kelly got it. Good job, Kelly. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and, and I'm just being goofy. Um, yeah, really, we're just looking for a place where there's class comments. I also... I also teach students to go into their assignments where the private comments are, because this is a great tool to use if you have a specific question about an assignment. So you can go into private comments and you can leave an, a note in your own voice or encourage your students to do that. Well, Stephen, I would have been in a lot sooner, but you wouldn't stop talking. <laughs> It's the way it goes, kiddo. <laughs> I know. I, I, I love you. I'm just joking. <laughs> and yeah, that's exactly why. Uh, Kaylee, I had the same thing because people were talking in the background. That's why it wouldn't go through. So you should be fine if we stop talking. <laughs> headphones. And Kaylee, Karen, Stephen will probably be able to answer that better than me. Kaylee, I, I have a feeling that what it is, is that it wasn't recognizing the microphone in your headset. I, it, it sounds to me like there was a, um, a disconnect there. What about refreshing with the yo? Um, the yoga or yoga, what there was a somebody asked about refreshing. How do um, I Karen. Yoga? Okay, so so Karen, it's it's if you're again you're on you're on a Chrome. Uh, if you're you're using Google Chrome, and I'm using a I, I have a yoga ThinkPad as well. The top of the uh, right beside the little house, there's a there's a little circly arrow. That's the reload the page button. And somebody else asked, why can I add a moat to someone else's and comment, but it won't let me add my own? That was Shannon. I don't it is actually doing the exact same thing to me as well. I could only add a moat if it was under somebody else's. Yeah, a anywhere on Google Classroom that there is a place where you can add a comment, right? If you can add a class comment, you can add a mode be be because I can type, right? And if I can type in a, in a comment box, the purple circle is there and I can add a, add a mode. Okay. So the Virginia, you, you wrote, I just don't have the moat icon, but you were able to do it. Um, so when you're saying that, are you saying you can't see it up in the top part of your bar at the top of your screen? And if that's true, that's because a lot of people have too many extensions and that's why it's not showing up there. Um, but if you can see it on your screen, that's all Stephen's asking. Okay, yeah, that's great. Right. I actually do have a lot of extensions, but um, my only question is that then, so the moat feature is to write a comment, not say post in the stream? No, the, you can do both. No, the, 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 the moat extension is specifically for recording your voice, yes. for recording and inserting a voice note into Google Classroom. Right. Yeah. So as, as an alternative to typing, as an alternative to speech to text, you can record your record your voice and attach it in Google Classroom. And also students can use that. So just so that all of you know, um, I've often used this. Um, teachers have used this for um, assessment purposes. You also can use this for assessment purposes. If you're working with a student, um, often the the uh, 
the amazing EAs that, that I work with every day, I have in the virtual school, we have them working on IEP goals sheets. And if they notice that students are, say, struggling or doing well with certain goals, um, they'll send like a little moat note. Um, we call them like moat notes. And they often send them to teachers and say, you know, like Billy is doing a great job on this task, but he's struggling on this task. Um, and we also have um, students that will send a moat note um, and often use that for answers, uh, for oral answers to tests, to assignments, to uh, different assessments, sometimes just for like reading goals or reading, um, reading something to answer a question, and they can set it up in, as a moat note. Okay, let's let's move on to the next item because um, and, and again, this this is still within moat. But let's just move on to the very next thing I wanted to show you. And I think this is just going to be a show because what I've discovered is that this tool and, and this this is actually brand new over the last couple of days, we can now insert moats into Google Slides, which is really, really fantastic, but it's only been available for the last couple of days. So let me show you how it works. I'm just gonna scroll in, and I've got a Google Slide that is right here. Let's see, let's go to, and, and this is, this is a, a growth mindset journal that a really awesome grade four teacher created. And notice how there's a bunch of little moat circles right here. Now, at the top of this Google slide, you can see the moat icon. And this is, this, is, this is like literally brand new. I discovered it the other day. I mean, it was, it was introduced, but there was no fanfare. It just happened to be there. So I thought, hey, look, moat, I'm gonna click this. What does it do? Well, here's what it does. It records my voice. This is an awesome tool for a student to use to answer a question in Google Slides. So many educators are using Google Slides with their students. So instead of a student typing, they can now tell you what they know using their voice. Here's the issue though. Okay, so I just did an 18 second recording. I can play it again. This is an awesome tool for a student to use to and listen to my voice slides. again, right? Um, but then when I'm ready, I can insert it. Abracadabra, hold tight while we auto-magically insert your moat. It looks really great, right? But here's the problem. Right now, as of today, as of Friday, January the 15th or whatever, it does not work in, it doesn't work for a student account, which is really, really, really bizarre. So right now, I'm just showing you that it's going to work. I've documented it. I've sent it to, um, to IT. They're, they're, they're hopefully going to fix it up. But this is an awesome tool for a student. Yeah, OK, stop talking. Um, it really is an awesome tool. As soon as they get it working for students, you will be able to put an assignment like this in, in for your student. How can we prepare for a positive day? What are th three things that you can do? And, in, and they can either type in a text box or they can use their voice to add a recording. So it is going to be awesome. That's why in the 26 Terrific Technology Tools um, Google Doc, I say coming soon because it is coming soon. It's not quite ready for prime time. It works for staff accounts. So I've left this in here. Um, the very first time that you click on it, it's going to take you through a ridiculous number of setup steps. And when I say ridiculous, I mean it. So that's why in your Google Classroom, I've given you, under Moat Resources, a Google Doc that you can reference when you're setting this thing up. Okay, so you can, 
you can not only set it up for yourself, but when it eventually, come on, load, when it eventually works for students, you can help your students as well. It also works, Steve, um, to be able to talk students through step-by-step -step things. So if they have difficulty with reading or they need to be told like step-by-step, -step, if there's a lot of writing, you can eliminate that writing and give them moat step-by-step instructions. You sure can, and that's, that is fantastic. All right. I have a quick question about all of these extensions. Um, we've been told to n try to minimize as many extensions are on the Chromebooks due to lagging or booting us out. Is this considered one of the extensions that would do this? Or to you, uh, Stephen, would it, is that a thing or not? This is, oh, and, and you're right, that's, that's an awesome question, and it's a legitimate concern. And where that, where that concern comes from is that in the Chromebook environment, our students can go to the, uh, the Chrome Web Store and they can load up their Chromebooks with extensions, right? They, they, they just can't. There's, there's no way to limit that. Um, so absolutely, in order to control performance and, you know, and, and to the remove the, um, the less than the chance of conflict, definitely. However, this is one of those tools that is so amazing for all of our students that it's definitely one that you need, that your students need, okay? Okay, perfect, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so let's, let's exit out of here. And we are going to switch gears just a little bit. And we're gonna move on from the purple circle. We're going to stick with the, the, the color purple because I, I wanna spend a little bit of time with you on the purple puzzle piece. The purple puzzle piece benefits all students. Inclusive technology benefits all students, essential for some, okay? So here, here's the very first thing. It's, and it's a troubleshooting issue again. If you, and I just, I got this inquiry yesterday from, from a cert in Ajax who said a parent reached out to them and they were having trouble with the purple puzzle piece when they installed it on their laptop. It wasn't giving them all of the tools that they were expecting to see. Some of them were gray. Well, what's the matter with that? As soon as you hear those words, I was installing the purple puzzle piece or Google read and write, that should set your spidey senses tingling because if you are logged in using the student's DDSB account, you never have to install anything. It installs automatically. It is seamless for you. So if I take a look and we go down to troubleshooting, I want to show you, and I'm not going to show it to you. I want to show you that I'm adding it for you. It's a little video that I created for students fixing problems on a Windows laptop. And it talks exactly about that problem. Okay. And you know what? I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch from my Chromebook over to my laptop so I can show you exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm going to click stop presenting and I'm going to present on my ThinkPad because I want to show you exactly what the what the issue is for those of you who are on um, Windows laptops or you're trying to trying to troubleshoot on a Windows laptop watch so different than a Chromebook a Chromebook is a single login. I just log in once, but a laptop is more complicated. And notice this, I have, if I put my mouse over this little picture of me, you can see this is my DDSB account. This is my Google login, my Google account login. The one up top, if I mouse over that and give it a click, you can see that it's my DDSB account. If both of these are showing my DDSB account. I will have no problems. I 100% guarantee it. If, however, watch this. 
if I have, for instance, I'm logged into Google Chrome using a personal Gmail account, then I'm not going to have the same capabilities with Google Read and Write. So let's see if, if I go to any web page at all. I don't know. Cute puppy pictures. I love cute puppies. There it is again. Got to get myself a cute puppy. Right? Notice how when I click the purple puzzle piece, oh my gosh, right? So it asks me to sign in. It only gives me these things. Everything else is grayed out. That's what the problem is. The problem is I'm not logged in using my DDSP account. I'm going to do a switcheroo to get back there and I'm going to have my, I'm going to have access again. Does that make sense? And again, in Google Classroom, let's see, let's present this screen. I gave you the steps that you can take that you can give to parents to help them log in. So let's go back into Google Classroom and check this out, signing into Chrome. This is a step-by-step -step procedure that you can give your parents if they're having problems with um, you know, not finding the right tools or having to install tools or whatever. Troubleshooting, so incredibly important. Let's see. All right, so let's X out of this. And let's, okay, we don't need to see that. And we're gonna open up a cool website. And we're gonna spend just a few minutes talking about the purple puzzle piece. We should all be encouraging our students to use this tool to read everything. Encourage all students to read everything. So I'm, I'm on National Geographic Kids right now. This is a fun website. Let's see, let's, let's look up something. How about um, Snow Leopard? Jeez, I always have trouble spelling leopard. Good thing I've got Google Dictation, right? Look at that, here it is. I'm gonna read about snow leopards. Waiting for it to install. It will not open as long as the web page is still loading. Oh my God, look at that tail. I'm gonna scroll down to the first paragraph and I'm gonna click the purple puzzle piece and the toolbar is going to pop up for me. Okay, this is so incredibly awesome and easy to use. It's going to read everything for you. All you need to do is tell it where to start reading. Okay, do a triple click, select the paragraph, click play. A snow leopard pairs down from a craggy. Pause, stop. It highlights the sentence that it's reading. It highlights the word that it's reading in blue. It's a dual modality learning. So as it's, you can watch it, you can listen to it. Man, oh man, it helps you with your comprehension. This benefits everyone, whether you're, a, whether you're an excellent reader, whether you're a struggling reader, okay? Um, you can encourage students to build their vocabulary looking, using a couple of these tools. So let's see, let's double click a word. So if you're coming, if you're reading and you're coming across a word that you don't know, uh, let's see, how about the word scrambles? you can click the dictionary and it gives you a bunch of definitions and it's a talking dictionary too. Scrambles. Now, It'll read it to you as well. In an undignified way. There's also a picture dictionary. You can change it to a different word. It'll give you a different definition and a different picture. This is so incredibly powerful and it works cross-platform. So for those of you who are on, on Macs or, or Windows computers, or it works as long as you're in Google Chrome, it'll work for you.
So here is another way that you can encourage your students to build their vocabulary. You can use the vocabulary tool. So you can double click different words, highlight them. Let me see, I'm gonna go with leopard. I'm gonna go with goat. And it doesn't matter what color that you use. How about feline? Pink. And then when I click the vocabulary tool, watch what it does. It's actually going to create a great Google Doc that has the word, that has the definition, and it takes the symbol out of the picture dictionary. Right, so now, plus there's a place for my own personal connections. And, uh, okay, come on pictures, and it's still loading. So another great way for our students to build their vocabulary. Um, now, English is a funny language. There's multiple definitions for each word. So I always encourage kids to, to read the definitions and delete the ones that they don't need. Leopard, the pelt of a leopard, that's a dumb definition for the word leopard, right? Great tool. And it puts it directly in your Google Drive. Here it is. Yay. All right. So I'm going to click this X. Before you get too far ahead, can I just ask a question? Sorry. Of course. Um, I typed it in the chat there, but I'm sure you can't see it because you're presenting. I'm just wondering when or if we consider this to be, you know, the read and write to be somewhat of a crutch at some point, because I'm specifically thinking of a student that I work with. And then I just heard you say that we need to encourage all students to use this. So that's, that's what made me think of this. But I have a student who's perfectly able of, of reading and writing and he doesn't. And because he's using Google read and write all the time, he, I, I notice he's not developing those skills. So where, where's the line between where this is helpful and where it's kind of like detrimental? So. I actually wrote you back, and I don't know if you've had a chance to read it yet, but coming from a special education um, viewpoint, um, there's two ways to look at this. Um, first, it's, it definitely is an extension of learning, and I've seen how this actually can help quite a few people, and basically an entire class. And the, and the way that you can do that is everybody doesn't have to read the same level of reading like for your kids that are able to read at a higher level then you can choose different things for them to read um, and you can actually increase their vocabulary by choosing the different level and make up like different groups just like you would in the reading group levels um, so basically if if ch teachers choose different group levels for kids and you get them focusing on different vocabulary or whatever and allowing them to learn, you know, different words by using like the different features, like the highlighting features and things like that and taking out those words uh, that are highlighted and basically practicing on those words. There's no harm at all in in um, practicing those higher level thinking words and using those skills because listening to words and listening to the fluency of words is what's going to teach them how to read, right? Okay. Um, also, the reading skills, somebody else just wrote, Virginia just wrote, plus the reading skills may be much higher than their comprehension skills, which is true. When they're focused on reading, often they can't answer vocabulary questions um, and comprehension questions because they're so focused on reading that all of their um, brain power is basically used up on trying to decode the words. So when something's being read to them, they're able to answer comprehension questions and therefore we're getting to see their actual knowledge. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. No it's, problem. Uh, I mean, it, it is a really, really great, great question, and it's it's definitely not an, an easy answer. But but that's definitely where I was going with with my answer too, Kelly. Um, and it's one of the reasons why uh, educators will always do read alouds for their kids, that's so exactly they don't have to use their brains to focus on decoding. They can just 
enjoy the story and focus on the comprehension and understanding what I'm hearing. And so th this, this is just another way of doing that. Um, so doing a control A selects everything and then I can click this clear highlights tool and I can get rid of my highlights. So dictionary, picture dictionary, vocabulary tool are three great tools to be building vocabulary with our students. Let us change gears and take a look at a couple of the writing tools really quickly. And again, I'm going through this, this really, really super, super quickly. Um, that's why I've given you resources in the Google Classroom. I wanted you to see it. I wanted us to talk about it, but then I, I wanted to give you the resources so that you could um, you know, practice with it later, right? And um, there was a question about videos, providing videos for parents. And um, I've actually created a YouTube channel that I can show you where all of these videos that, that I've got there come from. And this YouTube channel has about 30 or 35 different videos that I created for students and families. Okay, all sorts of different topics, the Chrome accessibility tools, Google read and write, organizational skills, everything. And they're all written and produced specifically for, for kids, especially for kids, but also for their families as well. Um, so I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a Google Doc um, and I've got the purple puzzle piece right here. Usually it will load for me. It's embedded in the toolbar. There's a couple of tools that I wanna show you. One is the prediction tool. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up the picture dictionary at the same time, okay? So when the, so the prediction tool gives me a list of words. It helps with word choice. It helps with spelling. If you are just want to type on the keyboard and have this as a, a helper, you can do that. Your student can do that. When I type the letter M, it gives me M words, Why? right? And if I type the letter O, R, oh my gosh, I found orange. orange. And notice how it's giving me pictures. This is very clicker-esque. For those of you who have used Clicker before with the prediction um, box, with the, with the visuals, that sort of thing, it makes your Google Doc into more of a Clicker environment. And notice how it's predicting, now that I type the word orange, it must be thinking that I want to use the word jumpsuit next. Right? No. I want to use hat, my orange cat. Now, something that blows kids' minds that they absolutely adore is that you can take a picture out of the picture dictionary and drag it right into your Google Doc and drop it in. Oh my gosh, there it is, my orange cat. So again, giving your students choice if they want to use these re uh, writing tools, perfectly fine to do that. Now, the other tool that I want to show you is this one. So remember when we, we spent some time on Google Dictation and, and I was like so excited and, and enthusiastic about Google Dictation and how it's really, really great? Well, guess what? When you're in a Google Doc, the very best tool for speech to text is this one right here. Yeah, this one will work. This one works better. When I click this button, a red microphone pops up. I talk, it types, watch. I have an orange cat and her name is Firefly. Turn off the microphone when you're done. Otherwise it'll keep on typing as I'm talking. I backspace and I put in a period. I have an orange cat and her name is Firefly. Right, space bar, think of my second sentence. This is so great for especially our younger students because what the thing that I do is I encourage them to do a step-by-step, -step. think of your sentence, click the button, speak, turn off the button, put the period in and listen, right? She likes to lie on her back so I can pet her tummy. She really does, it's so cute. Backspace, period. 
She likes to lie on her back so I can pet her tummy. I always encourage students, I mean, right now it, it reads every sentence. I always include, encourage students to reread what they've done when they're finished part of the editing process. You know how when you've got a piece of writing and they tell you to read it out loud? Well, you know what? I can use the purple puzzle piece to read it out loud for me. And then I can just focus on listening to it and figuring out, hey, did I make a mistake? How does that sound? Can I make it better? Right? So this is a great tool to use when you're editing your writing. Now, one of the things that I didn't show you was the three dots, and I've got a video for this. <laughs> I've got a video for everything. Go into options. This is where you can customize Google Read and Write for your student. Now, it automatically defaults to 50, which to me is a little fast. So I always turn it down to 35, 30, 35. You definitely wanna put a check mark in this box where it says speak on at each sentence. Okay, so that's the way um, when you put your punctuation in at the end, it'll reread the sentence, the last sentence that you typed. Oh my gosh, so awesome. Click OK. So here is the only, the exception with, with writing. Let's go back into where is, where was that? Oh, I must have closed it. So let's open up that Google slide file that I had open before. So many of our educators are using Google Slides. Okay. I, I just happened to glance at the chat and I saw that question, Leslie. So I'm going to do, I'm going to go back. It's under the three dots. If you click the three dots and go to options. Okay, and then this is where you change your speed. Like I said, it's at 50, 50 is really fast. I change it to 35, just to slow down the speed just a little bit. We usually do that for all of our kids as well, just so that you know, because most kids can't um, understand when it's reading that fast anyways. So as a rule, we generally change that. Super smart. All right. so. Most of our, many of our educators, at least as, as far as I've seen, are using Google Slides to encourage their kids to write as opposed to Google Docs. My preference, my personal preference, is to give students Google Docs because the tools work better, okay? It's more seamless, but I get it. You know, there's lots of stuff that they, they wanna share in a, in, a, in a Google Slide. So if there is a text box and the expectation is that the student should be writing, the best tool to use is not the purple puzzle piece. It's Google dictation. And here's why. Watch this. If I were to click the purple puzzle piece and, and try and use this tool, watch what happens. I want to use Google dictation to type my answer in Google Slides. Notice. Notice how it puts it down in the bottom under speaker notes. So Google Read and Write is not seamlessly connected to Google Slides. Okay, so any student, so a student who is using a laptop, you're, you're kind of out of luck because that's, that's what you're gonna have to do. So you're gonna have to teach that student to cut and paste it into the text box. For a student who is using a Chromebook, though, you can use Google Dictation. Google Dictation works so much better in Google Slides. Can I also say, um, Stephen, that it's very Google Slides that it's very important to use the correct um, tools with the correct program. So see how you notice that Stephen pointed out that this is the correct tool to use. Um, he didn't use Moat, he used this, right? Because this is the proper tool to use with this program, right? It's not that um, because these two um, work together well, 
okay? And it's important that you try and use the tools that work together with the proper tools, okay? With the proper programs, okay? And, and it, and with, with, without a doubt, Kelly. So, and, and that's exactly the reason why I wanted to show this because now that we're all excited about using Google Read and Write to help with our writing, then I, I, I don't want somebody going in there and thinking, what the heck, why doesn't this work? Right, so, so just the thing to remember when you're writing in a Google slide, the best tool is the purple puzzle piece. When you're writing in a Google Doc, the best tool is Google Dictation just to keep it as simple as possible. Um, let's go back to our Snow Leopard page because I wanted to show you one other, a couple of other things in here. Um, we did a little bit with the highlighters before when we used the vocabulary tool, but you can also help your students use this tool for their research when they're doing inquiry projects. So when I'm doing an in inquiry project, I am reading an expert source and I'm figuring out what's important for my project. Okay, so and and so I can I can just read it and I can or listen to it and then I can figure out, oh, this sentence is really important. So I'm gonna highlight it. I'm gonna keep on reading, reading, reading. Oh, look, the wild goat scrambles to escape. I mean, I can I can read this to myself, I can get the purple puzzle piece to read it for me, it doesn't matter. But the important thing is that I'm highlighting the important stuff out of the article. Okay, so a snow leopard is four to five feet with a tail up to 36 inches long. That's really important too. So I'm gonna take all of these things and then I'm gonna click collect highlights. Click. It's gonna say, what kind of, what colors do you wanna collect? Well, I'm gonna do all of them. I'm gonna click okay and then watch what happens. it's gonna open up a brand new Google Doc for me and it's going to just take the things that I need, right? The most important things. Plus it gives me a link to the page so I know how to get to it later. I can do this for multiple websites and I can have multiple Google Docs and then I can put them all together so I've got all of my research in one place. What a great research tool. Okay, so th this is like really, really great for all kids, regardless of level. Okay, control A, select everything, clear highlights. Now, let's go back to, let's go back to this piece of writing. Because I wanna show you another way that you can use your voice to provide um, oral instructions or feedback for your students, or your student can use it to, um, you know, just like Moat, to tell you what they know in a Google Doc. And it's using this tool right here, Voice Note. Right, so I'm gonna add a Voice Note. And when I click the button, it allows me to make a one minute voice note. I love writing about or reading your writing about your orange cat. It is so cool because I have cats of my own. Thank you so much for sharing. So I just created a 15 second recording. I can listen to it again. Okay, stop. When I'm happy with that, I can insert it right into my student's Google Doc. Here it goes. Notice how the colors are going across the bottom of the bar. That means it's working, it's doing something, and there it is. So it's just like a comment over on the side, except it's a voice note comment. So this is, again, this is a great way for you as an educator to give instructions or feedback to your student. But it's also a great way if your student had, if, if you give your student a question, that your student could actually answer or do an assignment just using their voice. Right? Again, just in a Google Doc right here. I have a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, uh, Louise and Joanne, I think, are both asking the same kind of question. Um, 
Joanne's asked if I'm on a student slide with them and, and I'm in a Google Meet with the class at the same time and I'm using a recording, does the rest of the students in the Meet hear my recording? No, that shouldn't happen. That's right. Um, if you mute your microphone, you can right. still, right? Mute your microphone so nobody else hears you. No. So that shouldn't happen. So I can answer that question myself. Um, and yes, you just did. Oh, I know. <laughs> Look, sorry, I was just reading it. Louise asked, will it cite sources? I don't understand what that question was. Yeah, okay. okay. So, so yeah, yes, it does. So we're, we're going back here. Okay. It, it kind of cites sources. It gives you a link to the website that you originally got it from. Okay. Okay, so again, if I've got if I've got four different websites and I made four different um, you know Google Docs, then I know that this one came from the National Geographic Kids site. And then if it's an older student and I'm teaching them how to do a bibliography, I can help them with that too. So okay. yes, the answer is and yes. One other question by Cheryl: um, If you're doing math in Google Slides and need to put symbols, what's the best one to use? And when I asked her what symbols she was talking about. Um, she says, like, um, multiplication or greater than or just be able to show 10 frames marked off. Um, using just slides itself is slow. So do you have any suggestions? Off the top of my head, no. I would have to look into that. That's what, You know what? If, if, if you want to send me that email offline, I can, I can definitely look into that for you. Okay. So Cheryl Chapman, please send Stephen an email. Get me up. Hit him up. He loves All to right. work. Okay, so let's see. We've got the voice notes. Let's go back Kevin to our. Crystal answered that and said Jamboard. Jamboard is excellent for math, Kevin. I would totally agree with you. Totally, totally, hundred percent agree with you. Okay, let, let's go back to the purple puzzle piece because there's another tool that I want to show you that is specifically for a student, and I'm sure you know the one you work with, the one who has difficulty focusing, right? Um, Screen Mask is the tool for you. When I click this, it gives me the ability to just focus on a, just a specific part of the screen, and this is moving down as I'm moving my mouse. Okay, I can also use this in conjunction with um, the play button, so I can have it reading. So let, let's, let's do that just for fun. Snow leopard. A snow leopard pair right, so I can follow along, I can listen, and everything else is grayed out. That was hard to listen to while I was talking. Um, you can change this, you can customize this so that you can change the background color, right? So if I want my background color to be, you know, blue, I mean, some students with their vision, they can see certain colors better than others. I've worked with a student who could, like who really could only dramatically see red was the major color. So all of his text was red. Um, you can change the, your reading light color. You can make your reading light, it's called a little bit bigger depending on the needs of your student. Okay, this is an awesome, simple, simple, simple little tool. And again, it's to help our students with their focus. All right. That also helps with kids with low and blind, like lower, um, low and blind vision. Visual That's impairment, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you're right, Kelly, absolutely. Okay, Let, let's, let's go back. Um, I wanted to show you this little tool here. It's called Practice Reading Aloud, and it's exactly what you would expect. It allows our students, and this is a great little assessment tool as well. You can give your student a piece of, of reading in their Google Classroom, and they can practice reading it, record themselves reading, and send this recording to you, okay? so. I've got this paragraph that I've written. I'm going to read my own writing here. So I'm going to select it. And then I'm going to press the practice reading aloud button. Okay, so here it is in the screen. I can practice as many times as I want. <clears throat> and then when I'm ready, I'm going to click the, the microphone. Let's do it. My orange cat. 
I have an orange cat and her name is Firefly. She likes to lie on her back so I can pet her tummy. All right, so I can listen to it again just to make sure that it's okay. My orange cat. There it is. When I'm ready, I can send that to my teacher. Okay, I don't want to send it to Banan Bunzi. I'm going to choose another teacher. It gives me a list of teachers that I've got in my Google Classrooms. If I don't see the teacher that I want on my list, I can click, enter their email address. I don't know, Cheryl is your email address, Cheryl. Cheryl. Chapman at ddsb.ca. Okay, look, I just sent Cheryl my recording, this wonderful re uh, reading that I just did. And yes, Kevin, you saw some <laughs> Lester B. Pearson names on that list. I wonder why. Um, so great little tool, again, that you can use with your kids. Give them a simple little reading. I've done this with, um, with SSP classes. Actually, I've done it with a Pearson SSP class before. Right? Give them a little reading, have them practice, record themselves, and then they can send it directly to you so you've got a record of their reading. Oh my gosh, great, great, great little tool. All right, now, if you want a little hilarity, we're going to uh, do some French. And I say that because I am not, I am solidly unilingual, but I show students all the time how to use this tool for, um, for studying in French, for reading and writing in French, because it's really good. I just can't speak the language. So I click the purple puzzle piece. And instead of just selecting and clicking play like I would if this was English, I'm gonna have to change the settings so it goes into French. So I'm gonna go into options and I'm gonna change my English voice by Ava and I'm gonna choose French Canadian Emily. She speaks really fast. So I have to slow her right down. I wanna make sure my translation is on English and then I want to change my language setting from English to Francais, from English to Francais, and click OK. Now, look at this. If I select and click play, Whoa. Emily, you are so good, right? So it, it, it reads it with excellent pronunciation. Um, even better, for somebody like me who has trouble with the words, I can use the translate tool and it'll translate individual words. I can use the picture dictionary for our visual learners. So I know now that cochon means pig, right? And I can change it to different words, right? That, that, this, was, this was me right before lunch. It even looks like me. Hey, right, double click, change it to different words. Oh, there's no picture for that. Such a great tool for students working in a second language. You have to remember to switch it back. Oh, why don't we take a look at some writing? If I wanna do some writing in French, I really don't. But if I did, this is what I would tell my students to do. Turn on talk and type and then turn it right off. Now, notice how I've got it set up for English, English USA. I'm gonna scroll down until I come to French. There it is. And then as soon as I click this and it turns red, I will embarrass myself by saying something in French and it will actually type in French. Bonjour, comment ça va? Okay, so the thing that I always caution uh, kids when I'm working with them is that if you're like me and you can't pronounce the words very well, this is not going to work very well for you. 
Okay, so it's particularly good for older French immersion students or students who have been taking French for a number of years um, who have a good handle on the pronunciation. You did an excellent job, Stephen. Oh my God, Kelly, stop. You're embarrassing me. Um, so, the, and, then, and then the other thing, of course, is changing your input. You can change to a French keyboard, right? So now my dictation will work en français. I can type words and have access to the accents and, and all of that stuff. Please don't ask me any questions about it because that's about all that I've got, okay? I'm gonna change this right back to English. Somebody in the chat box just asked, is this specific explanation on your YouTube channel? About changing the languages? Um, yeah. I, I, I have been, Karen, I've been holding off and, and talking, you know, encouraging the French uh, facilitators and coaches to put things up there. So I have not put anything on the channel, but I can definitely look for, um, look for resources for you. Okay, thank you. All right, so, oh, right. And, and like I said, do not forget to change your settings back. Kids absolutely love it when the English voice reads French because it sounds ridiculous and vice versa. Come on, Eva, where are you? Back and click okay. And you know that you've got it when you do a mouse over and it shows you the English, uh, the English mouse over or the French mouse over the label there. All right, let's, let's take a look at Google Classroom. And again, we've just gone through the purple puzzle piece, the big flyover. Now we're going to level up in Google Classroom. And when I say level up, I'm talking about some of the things that I've seen over the last, last year or so that we've been doing this, this virtual learning that really makes things difficult for, for our students, okay? And, and so I'm gonna give you a couple of, of, of things, a couple of tips. So let's, let's go back into Google Classroom, back to the main classwork page. If you have a student Probably the best thing that you can do for your student. If you have a student who um, does not need a specific assignment, the best thing that you can do is remove that student's name from the assignment. Google Classroom is created so that I can create an assignment for one student or a hundred students, right? Or any, any number in between. But what, what often happens, and I was working with a student yesterday, um, a grade three student with autism who got so incredibly overwhelmed because there are dozens and dozens and dozens of assignments in his Google Classroom, and he's not doing any of them, right? He's only doing a couple, and, and yet all of the assignments are there. The best thing that we can do is go in and remove that student's name from the assignment. And then it no longer shows up for them in their Google Classroom. It absolutely simplifies that student's life dramatically. And this is actually something that you can do. I know you're not responsible for, you know, for creating the Google Classrooms or organizing it or anything, but you're definitely part of the team supporting our identified students. So if you notice that there's a whole ton of assignments that your student can't handle or doesn't do, then perhaps you can collaborate with the CERT um, and the teacher to go in there and just edit and, and take that student's name out, right? I 100% hundred, I hundred um, think that's a fantastic idea. And I've had many of the students that I've been working with in the last two campuses that I've been working with virtually come up to me because you guys are the people that are on the ground floor and you're the people that are working with the students closely, more so than the teachers sometimes. So 
Um, your opinions and um, your voice is what matters a lot of the time for these kids more than anybody. So it's very imperative that you share that information and you're the people that are going into the classes. And the teachers are very overwhelmed right now, as I'm sure you guys are as well. Um, but when they're looking at 30 students, they're not often looking at the one or two students that are in their classroom. So it's great if you go in there and you say, hey, they've got all these assignments and I know that, that they're not really doing them. So is it okay if I just take them out of your classroom because they're only working on these assignments? I'm sure they'd be very happy to know that you're going to do that for them. And if you need to, just touch base with your cert. That'd be great. A uh, quick question about that. We've been told that we're not to actually be alone with students in breakout rooms. So I don't know if that how that would work if we didn't have immediate, like a, an additional body to be able to join us. So, okay. so you know what, we're not even talking about breakout rooms or, no. or Google Meets right now. No. We're just talking about cleaning up Google Classroom. Right, but sorry, I mean like to work one-on-one -on -one with a student. Like, is that, I'm just checking, is that okay in this format since we're not allowed to do it within Google Meet? So when you're, what, what we're talking about is cleaning up the classroom. So when you meet with your, because I'm sure at one point or another, you meet with your cert, right? Right. Yep. Okay. So when you meet with your cert, you can say, I notice in the Google Classroom, if you're working in a Google Classroom, that a student has, you know, all these assignments that are incomplete. Um, and just say, is it okay with you? Or could you speak to the teacher and ask if um, it'd be okay with them if I just remove them? Sorry, that's Oh, crazy. okay. I misunderstood. I'm sorry. I thought you said for us to, to complete those with them. Sorry. I misunderstood. Perfect. Um, yeah, th thanks. Thanks for asking for clarification, because it really is an important point. You, you guys have such an incredible role in in simplifying the life for our students. Right. Um, OK, so. We talked about removing a student from an assignment. One of the other the other tips that is really, really important is to provide all the support material in that in, in one particular assignment, right? So I've seen lots of assignments where students have to jump back and forth and click and do all this and that. And oh my gosh, it's just way too much for our kids. So if you can um, support by making sure that student assignments have good instructions, for instance, Right, so that a student, and, and I'm sure, you know, you've worked with or are working with a student where you give them instructions and then five minutes later, they're like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing, right? If they have those instructions right there in their Google Classroom assignment, then um, it, it, it just, it makes life so much easier for that student. Okay, and you can add other things as well, right? Making sure that they've got all of the, um, the resources they, they need, the links to websites, the, the success criteria, the learning goals, like all of that stuff can be right there in one assignment for our kids. It just works so much better, okay? Um, let's talk about, let's talk about attachments and making sure that things are readable. This is like one of the hugest things, problem areas that I see almost every day with the students that I work with. They are in a Google Classroom and the things that they have in their assignments, they can't use their tools to read, right? They, 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 they can't read. So here's the, here's the um, what you always look for. This is the rule. If I'm in my attachment and I can double click, if I can double click and select, hang on, what's going on here? There it is. If I can double click and select a word, that means it's text and then I can use my tools to read if I need that reading support. If I look what happens if I try and double click this word. Uh-oh doesn't work. That means that this is not text. This is an image of text. It's a picture of text and the tools aren't going to work for you or for your student. Okay. So these are something like, so th this, this is something where you can keep your eye out for the assignments that students have. But let's take a look at, at another example. 
I've got another exemplar here with a bunch of different attachments. So some of the things that you might, you might see. Oh my gosh, clicking, scrolling down. Just like processing requests first and then scrolling down. Right, so there, there's a bunch of different attachments here that I put in this assignment. The, the best is a Google Doc, right? But sometimes educators will put a Word file in, right? Because we're all used to Microsoft Word. And so if I already got my stuff there, why don't I just put it into Google Classroom? Well, the reason why you don't is because now you're just giving your students more work. Because what do I have to do now? I have to open it with Google Docs because the purple puzzle piece doesn't work natively in, um, in a Microsoft Word file. Okay, so I'm giving my student more work. What happens if, and I sometimes see this, I put things in as an image. This is a picture. Uh-oh, can I double click a word? No, I can't. It just zooms me in. So the purple puzzle piece isn't gonna work. It's not gonna read for me. The a PDF can potentially be fine. Portable document format, in case any of your friends ever ask. If we ever have a party again, it's a little, little party fact, All right? Look, I can select it. So the PDF reader is going to work. Sometimes I'll open a PDF and I can't select the file. So it's just a picture and it doesn't work. Okay, so it takes a little bit of troubleshooting and figuring out what's a good attachment and what isn't. I'm gonna show you a couple more and then I'm gonna be done with attachments because they make, will make your eyes glaze over, I'm sure. But man, oh man, it's so important because your, 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 your student who needs that reading support can't get it. A uh, question in the text box. Um, do you need text help PDF reader extension? Automatically installed. Okay. Automatically there for you. Um, yeah, it's, it's part of the, 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 the DDSB image. So again, assuming, assuming you're logged in using your credentials, your DDSB credentials, you'll have it. Um, check, check this out, Google Slides. I'm gonna open this up and I see this a lot. Educators have found this awesome resource, this wonderful formatted document, and then they stick it into a, a Google Slide file. All right, hang on, it's still loading. Let's zoom in so you can actually see it, unless your eyes are way better than mine. Look at this. It's, it's all Francais for one thing, but look, I can't select that. So it's just a picture. This is great for the kids who, who don't have any problem reading. But for the students who need the reading support, this is a picture. It's, it's not text, so none of our tools are going to work. So this is something that we need to be aware of at all times when we're creating assignments. And if you happen to see that, and you know your student is struggling because they can't read the stuff that you've got that, that you know, the, the teacher has given them, then, you know, definitely touch base with your, ter your cert, touch base with your teacher, and, and see if we can't do that. Okay, two more questions. And I think I know the answer to the first one, but um, which is, would the screen reader button work to read boxes that have images? And in my experience, it generally reads, but it will obviously won't read the picture. It's um, not great, right? So in, in a nutshell, yes, but it's not great and it takes longer. Right, because it has to load all of the pictures and everything like that. So it's longer. And, 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 yeah. what, and what it's doing is it's scanning. Right, so it's actually scanning and it's, it's running through something called optical character recognition. So it's trying to create letters out of little black dots. Right. And, and then once it does that, and it takes a long time, then it will, it, it will read, but it's, it's not accurate. Right. Was there another question, Kelly, or was that it? Um, the other one, it's from Kevin, and would that accessibility select to speak Oh, right. No. Um, great question, Kevin, but no, it would not. It, it, it does a great job of reading things that Google Read and Write does not, but it, it doesn't scan an image like that. It's still looking for text. It just takes different types of text. 
right? So it'll read this text, but it won't read the, 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 the actual picture inside that Google Slides. And that makes 100% sense. If anybody thinks about that, obviously it can't read it if it's a picture, right? Um, a, a couple of other simple little things that you can do for your students. And, and I know every, everybody now is using uh, topics, which is really great. Here's what I see that's, that, that I, would, I would discourage. I see a lot, of, um, a lot of educators creating a topic for a student. Okay, and so they say all the student has to do is scroll all the way down to their name and everything under their topic is going to be their assignment. Okay, so again, that's okay until you have the student that I was working with yesterday had a massive Google Classroom and, and you know, he had to do a lot of scrolling to get to his name. And so it, it's just, it's, it's creating extra stress, take his name out of everything else. Topics in general are good to organize your Google Classroom. The other thing is good that, that is good is to put due dates on your assignments. Help your students, especially those students who you know, have that executive function organizational challenge issue, um, figure out what priorities they should have. So by putting deadlines on your assignments, then they, can, they know what they're going to be doing next. Plus, it's really great when we take a look at Google Calendar in just a couple of minutes. Um, right. Somebody else in the chat box mentioned, and we did this at my last virtual school, was um, some teachers made their own Google Classroom for individual students, um, especially if they had their own assignments so that they didn't have to see the clutter of the other classrooms. Yeah, and, and, and again, there's no clutter if... if they're only seeing the work that they do. And the reason why you don't, why it's, it's not recommended to do a, a Google Classroom just for one or two students is, is we wanna be inclusive, right? We want our, our students to be included in the whole classroom. We want them to be able to go up to people and see every student in the class and like, hey, I'm a part of this class. I have different work, but I'm still a part of this class. Right. So, so I, again, I understand why that's being done because it does make life simpler for us when we're putting things together, but, but thinking it from, from a perspective of, of the student, we want that, that inclusivity that having the student in the classroom and then we can modify the classroom to suit the students, not the other way around. Okay. I totally, totally. Um, Penelope says we do use due dates a lot. That's great. I love that. And here I'm going to, this is a nice segue into our next, our, in our next and our final section on organizational skills. Um, it's a very nice segue because the due dates are so incredibly helpful. I can't demonstrate this because I've only got a couple of Google classrooms where I'm a student and I don't have a whole lot to do, but this to do button is pretty awesome. Oh my gosh. So when I click the to do list, this is a great tool for seeing all of your assignments in one screen for all of your classrooms. So for those rotary kids in grade seven and eight that have multiple Google classrooms, they can see all of their assignments that they've got listed by due date. So 21 assignments with no due date assignments for this week, assignments for next week, assignments for later. Again, trying to get students to, to get organized with their assignments. And if, we are if we're only giving students the assignments they need, they don't have a whole lot of extra assignments showing up on their to-do list, right? I can choose and I can just, hey, I'll just select Mrs. Howard. Anybody know Mrs. Howard? I do. Um, there's 10 assignments with no due dates. Right? So I can see specific classrooms just like that. I can look to see what work I've got missing. I don't have anything missing because I hardly have any work. But if I didn't complete an assignment by the due date, it would show up on my missing list. I tell students to feel good about yourself by clicking the done button and then you can see all of the assignments that you've completed. <laughs> I've done no work, right? It's, 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 
it's, it's right here. It's all in one view and it's so incredibly powerful. And we, this only works if we clean up the Google classrooms and have differentiate those assignments for specific kids. Okay. Now, the last thing that I want to want to show you from this tool, let's scroll down to one of my classrooms where I'm a student. If a student only has one Google Classroom, then you want to show them how to use View Your Work. Because View Your Work is really great because this shows the back and forth between the educator and the student. Here are all of my assignments. Here are the ones that have been returned by the teacher with an assessment or with comments, all zero of them. Here are the ones that are missing that I haven't completed. Okay, so there's, there's a couple of different options. This is great for younger students who may only have one classroom, but you still want them to have a simplified view of the work that they have to do. All right. And one thing I want to mention, I mean, the, the ladies and gentlemen that we're dealing with today are the educational assistants, so they don't really have any say in the Google Classrooms, right? It's the teachers that have created these and how they choose to create them is not up to these fine ladies and gentlemen today, <laughs> right? So they don't really have any say in that part. Oh, um, absolutely. But, but, yeah. but as, as we've said before, every one of you are part of the team. And Agreed. every one of you supports students. And if you see a student that is overwhelmed because they've got right. so many things that they have to do or think they have to do, then you know you can bring it up when we're 100%. talking about the team. And, and that's why I said that. That's when yeah. like you guys are the are the you know the people at the forefront, the people that are the foundation that keeps everybody running and schools running everywhere. And we definitely do work together and I 100% agree. That's why I'm part of the EAPD and, and working really hard to make sure that everything gets done. But I want, I want to make sure that everybody knows that we know that educational assistants don't always get the, the, the say that they deserve. So I want to make sure that um, you know that everybody knows that we're, we're doing we're, we're providing the the um, professional development but we also know that you guys only have so much power in that department okay so I know because I'm in the schools and I've been doing it for a long time but we do we want you to know that we know that you're doing everything that you can I, I want to I want to honor your time here we've only got one more topic and um, I, I, want to talk, I want to talk to you about it right now. Google Calendar, one of my favorite tools, something that I use personally to help manage my home life. It's something that I show students how to use to manage not only their school, but their home, everything. Okay, we have a fully integrated uh, version of Google, uh, Google Calendar available to us, all staff and students. Remember what I said about the due dates. The most important thing, the most, one of the most important reasons why you put a due date on, on an assignment is that it will then show up on the student's Google Calendar. It's a visual reminder that I've got an assignment today. The different colors are for different classrooms. Zooming over to the left, I can see all of my classrooms. It's really, really awesome. Catherine, anytime you see this waffle, you can click on it and you can go to calendar. You can bookmark it so that it's up here at the top on your bookmarks as well. Um, you can do awesome. really, Thank you. really, really funky things here. You can actually install the Durham District School Board holiday calendar. You can install any of a number of, of other special calendars. I have all my favorite sports teams. So if I want to know when the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Toronto Raptors play next, I can do that. I can put that on my calendar, right? I turn on the calendar and whoops, I didn't want week. I want month and check it out. The little blue circle, that means today. Let's see, I've got four more things. Oh, look, the Leafs play the Senators tonight at seven. I know what I'm doing tonight. Um, 
right? And that's a real buy-in for our kids as well. How do you do that? Plus sign at the top. Browse calendars of interest. Ooh, this is fun, right? So I can add different names in my contacts so the birthdays all show up so I, I, I never forget when my mom's birthday is. I can scroll down and I can see all these different sports teams. The only complaint that I, oh, look, it's got, it does have the CFL, so I can, I can go down here and I can choose my Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Yes, right? So you, you, you can do some great things on your Google Calendar. I like the week view. I'm gonna go back to the week view. And I, I created for the morning group a science test at two o'clock, right? You can put all sorts of different things. When I was working with students in the schools, we were using this as a daily agenda. So I can create something up here. I can use Google dictation, agenda. I can change to a different color. It's gonna be green. I can put whatever description that I like Right? You know how you use your agenda, that paper thing that you take to, to different classes and write in? Well, you can add descriptions and you can save it right in your Google Calendar. Right? So here's everything that I have to do today. Now, what's even better is you can install the Google Calendar mobile app on your phone, log in using your DDSB account, and you can update your calendar either on your phone or on your Chromebook or, or laptop, and it will, it will synchronize in both places. This is something that's a real winner for our students as well. And if you wanna do something that will absolutely um, you know, give you huge points with your parents, encourage them to download the Google Calendar, Google Drive, Google Classroom app, log in using their student's account, and then they have easy access to their stuff. So, hey, my son has got a doctor's appointment. I can put it directly into the calendar, right? And then it'll show up for him. This is a transferable skill that we can be teaching our students right now that they can take with them into intermediate, high school, post-secondary, and the work world. I don't care how old you are. I've, I've worked with kids in grade four on how to use their calendar. It's a really, really awesome tool. Uh, let's see. Let's go back. Oh my gosh, you know what I forgot to do? Uh, I forgot. Kelly, I forgot to send out the, the spreadsheet with the attendance and stuff. Do you think I had to do that now? I think that's probably a good idea. You think, huh? I do. And I also, um, I have a question in the chat box. Um, so one person asked, um, because Everybody, of course, want, knows that you recorded this session and they want to know where you're going to post it. I'm assuming you're going to post it in this classroom. That would be a great assumption. I hadn't even thought about it, but you know what? That would be a definitely a great assumption. I'll probably upload it to the YouTube channel. But but yeah, the, the classroom would be good. OK, so everybody knows where it's going to be posted. And so I don't have to answer any more of those questions. Um, with regards to that, we have one person at the very end that might need some assistance with um, Moat. And right. other than that... Okay. Um, Give me just a second here. I have just... Is that the sheet? Yeah, we, yeah. we need access to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so it just says viewer dummy. I just did the wrong thing. Okay, let's try this again. I have it. Yeah, I know, but but you were only allowed to preview it. Okay, try now. So just just find your name, initial beside your name, put your school in if you like, just that, that'll be for interest for me. And um, yeah, that, that, that would be really awesome. I'm gonna hang around here for just a little while, no, more, more than a little while. If you have questions on, on the chat or anything, I'm happy to, to work with you for a little while longer. 
It's 2.35. If you want to leave and take an early start on your weekend, by all means do that. Uh, hang on here. Let me go back to this. And Joanne Burton needs to stay back to if she doesn't have access to moat yet. Fair enough. Can I, I ask you a question about moat? Okay. If, is this Joanne Burton? No. Okay. Well, Joanne Burton, Bo Burton is, has trouble with moat. So let's see if we can get her on moat. And then I, I can maybe answer your questions about moat. If, okay. um, so I put the link to the spreadsheet in the chat. If you want to click that, pop your initials in there. Yeah, that would make great. sure to look at it on that if you want to answer questions. Okay, so Crystal, anybody who doesn't have their name on there, I'm going to type it in, okay? Well, I, yeah, Crystal, add your own name in at the bottom. Oh, look at that. You're such a good delegator. <laughs> All right, I'll be in charge of that. Do you want to answer questions then, Steve? Of course. All right. Get people to raise their hands and then Steve can answer the questions of the people who raise their hands. Oh my gosh. Okay. It says we do not have access to Google Calendar. Charlene, I, I clarify that for me because we should. Everybody does. Charlene, do you want to pop in and, and, uh, and talk about that for a sec? How do you add a DDSP calendar to your calendar? Sherry, I found that on the ddsp.ca. I actually found the link. And let me go back to present now. Let's do that. Let's do that one more time. I found the link on the ddsp.ca website. And then when I went to adding calendars, uh, from URL. And then I just copied the URL from um, the DDSB website and I added the calendar and it popped in. If your name is not on that spreadsheet, please add it at the bottom. I have no idea why you're not there. I assume if you registered, you would be there, but this is the first time I haven't controlled my own registration and, and I haven't really known who was coming and I didn't send out the link and, and it was, oh my gosh, so stressful. Both signatures are already on there. We're not missing very many. Good to know. If for some reason you can, I, I know that there's some people who are on, uh, who came in today not using their DDSP account. I think that's probably your issue. Ashley, I wonder if that's your issue, um, but, but we, can, we can certainly, we can explore that. I'm looking for a Caitlin and a Julie. Ashley. Hey, and, and if you don't have any more questions and you've signed the sheet and, and everything is working well, have a great weekend, everybody. And Ashley, would you like to share your screen so we can check a, do a little troubleshooting together? Mercury, you're not on there, but you need to add your name. Mercury Dance, you need to add your name. Hi, I'm just curious if the YouTube video or channels that you're talking about are going to be added to our classroom as well. Oh, gosh, you know what? I did say that I was going to add that, didn't I? You got to do some work, Stephen. Jesus. <laughs> I'm tired. Come on, buddy. I'm just wondering if you have my name. It's Brittany Route, or if I need to add it somewhere. I'm just getting a little bit okay. confused here. 
So if, 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 if it's if it's not if it's not on that spreadsheet, then that means for whatever reason they didn't have you registered. So for sure, add it to the Brittany. bottom. I think your I, name is Brittany. I think so it's Brittany. Thank you, guys. Sign. Thank you. But anybody who like you've got to come in here to see. I, I'm looking for an Angela Fitzpatrick. I'm looking for a Jennifer. Uh, Angela's with, here as well. Okay, so you guys have to come on and sign or do your initials. Caitlin Booth, Julie. Starts with a B. All right. Jessica Dallaire. So Ashley, if you're still here, would you like to share your screen so we can troubleshoot why you can't download mode? Ranjana, Siobhan. Can mode be transcribed into text? It actually does do that, yes. So if a student talks in when, once they're set up to be able to do so, if they make a recording, then that can be transferred into a text for the teacher? It's, um, let's see, how, how does that work? Yes, when you first record the mode and then you click done, you're gonna see the text that popped up. So it, it does transcribe what you're saying. We'll, we'll have to just double check to see how, like once you've actually inserted it into the Google Classroom, what, what format that you have access to, whether it's just the audio or whether there's text as well. Okay. Hi there. Sorry, um, I can't seem to get access to the spreadsheet and I think it's because I'm not using the DDSB. Um, my name is Tracy Scott Lopers. My name that's showing up is Mercury Dance. That's probably that's exactly why. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I was so, just wondering if I'm actually on the spreadsheet. Well, that's good. Tracy Dance. Well, what am well, I not? Um, no, showing up. My name on the screen right now is showing up as Mercury Dance, but my name is Tracy Scott Lopers. <clears throat> yeah, it's on here, and okay. I've already got somebody signed in and put Village Union. So was that you? Perfect. But no, I said that I couldn't figure it out, so someone probably did it for me. Okay, then you're good to go. Thank you. No problem. 